Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Ministry in the Spirit. We're looking at all the different ways that Jesus calls us to serve Him and to serve others. Jesus is the model minister and what we see Jesus doing, He empowers us to do the same. To heal the sick, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel, to serve one another and to do the things that God has called us to do. Now we're in the middle of teaching on the deliverance ministry and that ministry begins with the knowledge that we have been delivered from the power of Satan. We've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and we've been placed into the kingdom of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Savior. It has to do with forgiveness of sins that our sins are forgiven and we are delivered from the bondage of sin. But it also means that we have been given authority over the works of the enemy. The Bible says the Son of Man came to destroy the enemy and to destroy his works. God has given us that same ministry. It's not our own authority, it's not our own power. When Jesus spoke a word of deliverance, he commanded demonic spirits to leave. He commanded the power of demonic spirits to be broken. And he was concerned that people would be so set free that he would say, go, speaking to the demon, never return. That's the same kind of ministry that you and I have. So in today's program, we're talking about total and complete deliverance through the ministry of Jesus. Then we have, don't return, never enter him again. Mark 9, 25, Jesus saw the people come running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Now, some people have made a great deal of this, saying that unless you say, enter him no more, then the demons can come back and bring seven others with them. You've got to be very careful. I don't you think you can exaggerate that point. There can be a very simple reason why Jesus said, enter him no more, is because this had been a repeated problem. That this demon had come upon him periodically. So he says, come out now and don't come back. In other words, the demon had been leaving this boy for a period of time and coming back. So he was simply addressing this demon according to its activity. And he was therefore giving the correct prescription according to the correct diagnosis, to use the medical, medical terms. And uh, some people, however, still want to say a very strong point about the places in the Gospels, Matthew 12, where it says, you know, verses 43 to 45, if a demon leaves and then can come back bringing seven, uh, you know, st stronger than himself. Well, First of all, it's not altogether clear that that means deliverance because the demon goes out. It doesn't say the demon's driven out. Also, is that it shows, as we've been teaching in this ministry model, how important it is that after all ministry, whether it's healing from physical diseases, counseling, or deliverance ministry, that you spend time with the person and the person is built up in Christ after this period of ministry so that they remain strong and that something else won't happen to them. Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come to you. Uh, and, and so Jesus obviously wants us to minister to people in that way, realizing it's a long-term uh, deliverance that we're looking for. And so here we have some of the things that Jesus said. Another thing we noticed when Jesus ministered to people who were demonized was that he made no distinction between them at all. No distinction between the levels of demonic affliction. Now, today it's very popular to do this. And I'll tell you why it, it, it's happened. Because the Bible has translated this word as demon possession, then the question is, well, not 
all the cases of demonic affliction seem to be cases of possession. So they will say, what about oppression? Or what about depression? I suppose you can have oppression, depression, suppression, and you can go on categorizing. And at the end of the day, you've spent so much time categorizing demons rather than driving them out, okay? Now, it's interesting that Jesus d does not distinguish, perhaps, between Simon Peter's mother-in-law, who had possibly a demonic fever, and the Gadarene demoniac, who was totally possessed. You surely would want to use that word of him. And it all comes because we don't properly translate the word uh, that's used here in the Greek, which is daimonizomai, daimonizomai, which means, probably better translated, demon afflicted or demonized. Let's just make a verb out of it, demon afflicted a demon-afflicted person, or a person with a demonic problem. Okay, that's probably the best way of trans translating it. And so the real question is, you know, uh, what kind of ministry does this, does this person need? Uh, and is there a demon there? So it's, it's not a question of really having to be so specific about these, categorized, uh, these categories. Although, if you're going to go into a severely uh, afflicted person's home and minister to them, I think you've got to be prepared for that. So you know you will find various degrees, just like you find some sicknesses which are life-threatening, socially disadvantaging, uh, socially you know, alienating. You've got all kinds of diseases. There are all kinds of demonic activities. But the most important thing to know is that there's a demon there, and the demon's got to go. Do you understand the balance that I'm trying to present to you? And it's very difficult to teach on this subject because you have to pick your way through a minefield of, uh, of extremism on the one hand and indifference on the other. For To some people, the devil hasn't just got two horns, he's got ten horns or a thousand horns. Actually, he's probably got no horns. And, uh, or, or, or the demon doesn't exist at all as far as some people are concerned. We need to get the balance. And the balance is this. There are hurting people out there who are afflicted by demons and we need, in the name of Jesus Christ, to set them free. Okay. Now, another important point. Jesus made a clear distinction between driving demons out and healing diseases, even though there were some instances where demons brought disease. But deliverance from demons and healing are separate and there's a distinction between them. Have a look at Matthew 8, verse 16. It says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast the spirits out with a word and healed all who were sick. Can you see setting the categories apart? He cast the demons out and he healed the sick. So there were some who were demonized who weren't sick and there were some who were sick who weren't demonized. Those are two different categories, although there are some who are sick and demonized. So you've got all, all categories, but it's important that you have these distinctions in your mind. Otherwise, you'll be casting demons out of everybody, even if the demons aren't there, or you will be at times ignoring the true nature of the problem. Uh, have a look at Luke 7 and verse 21. At that very hour, he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and he gave many blind, he gave them their sight. Okay, so uh, there's a very clear distinction between being demonized, needing deliverance, and having some other form of sickness, whether it is, you know, a mental sickness or epilepsy. And uh, somebody who has an epileptic fit you know, superficially can look like, it, like a demon has taken control, and it's nothing to do with a demon. It is a person who has epilepsy. I'm not suggesting that um, all epileptics are demonized. I, I'm saying the opposite, really. I suppose you've got to allow for a demonic element in some instances, but it's wrong to assume that those kind of manifestations are demons always. Uh, and you've got to really 
be careful and be guided by the Holy Spirit. Notice when Jesus healed the woman who was crippled by a demon in Luke's gospel, he first released her from bondage. He said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And then he laid hands on her and she was healed. So the suggestion is here is that when Jesus pronounced that freedom on her, she was set free from the demon. And then the, what, the work that the demon had done, Jesus undid by laying hands on her. So she, she was healed and delivered. I want you to notice the source of Jesus' authority. Now, in Jesus' day, even some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists cast demons out by using long lists of names. Some of them even try to use Jesus' name, and it seems in Mark 9, 38, with some success. That's the grace of God. But in Acts 19, where some of the vagabond Jews tried to do it, they said, uh, we command you in, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, and the demon said, we know Jesus, we know Paul, but who are you? And uh, it, it, well, it didn't go well for them as those, uh, they fled for their lives. So you can't trifle with the name of Jesus. You must know that there is authority in the name of Jesus. And so Jesus did it through the authority that the Father had given them. Specifically, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12 and tw verse 28, he says, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So Jesus did this by the Holy Spirit. And notice here, in uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12 and verse 28, we have a key statement concerning the deliverance ministry. And it shows what a key sign this is for the kingdom of God, which shows that when we preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, expect to have to cast out demons. Expect that alongside the ministry of the kingdom of God comes this deliverance ministry. Because where the kingdom of God comes, Satan is exposed and his kingdom is being destroyed. So Jesus said, if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons then the kingdom of God has come upon you. It is one of the characteristic signs of the kingdom. So we can be excited about that. Nobody likes this ministry. It's, a, it's, it's not a pleasant ministry, but it's a powerful demonstration of who God is. And so even Jesus depended on his anointing with the Spirit as he ministered to the demonized people. And so we must depend upon the anointing and leading on the Holy Spirit. In Mark 9, verse 29, we have this statement. Jesus said to them, This kind cannot come out but by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. And so that shows another reason for Jesus' effectiveness. Um, and uh, in, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, the, the, the disciples were unable to uh, cast the demon out. And then later on, Jesus explained to them, this kind doesn't come out except by prayer and by fasting. And there was no record of Jesus fasting just at that time of, the ministry, of his ministry. So it meant he was already prepared. And so this tells us two things. It tells us that we should be constantly prepared with prayer and fasting, just as our regular discipline if we are seeking to minister in the Holy Spirit. Let, let me pause. I, 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 want, I want to talk to you about this for a moment here. Uh, because, you know, if you really are serious about ministering in the Spirit, you are going to wait on the Lord. You're going to spend time ministering before the Lord in the Spirit. You're going to pray. You're going to fast. And during that time, God will show you things, and God will equip you and anoint you. And then you'll go into the public place, and you'll see the fruits of it. So remember that. And the other thing is that it seems here to be, uh, possibly Jesus is saying that, that there was a, a particular need to fast on that occasion, a particular need for prayer. So bear that in mind. At certain times, God will make that very, very clear to you. Then another reason, of course, why Jesus was so effective was because of faith. And we will see this a little later on, uh, how, how that works. It's by faith. I think casting demons out is an act of faith. 
And so we must grow strong in faith. Okay, I want you to notice something else. Jesus terrified demons. I want you to notice that. All right? He terrified them, and he will continue to terrify them. If Jesus is in you, then you will terrify demons because Jesus is in you. Now, the Gospels show that the demons varied in their powers. This is about as deep as I get when I talk about demons, okay? They vary in their powers. They intent on people's destruction is all you need to know. They can bring disease. They can speak. They are spirit personalities. They can be enormously strong. They can possess supernatural knowledge. And several can, and can afflict a person simultaneously. Okay? That's, that's about all you need to know, except one other thing. By the way, friends, they're terrified of Jesus. Okay? That's really, really, really all you need to know. Okay? Do notice, too, that people reacted to Jesus' deliverance ministry in lots of different ways. Sometimes there were reports of astonishment and a spreading reputation. Sometimes the crowd was struck, awestruck with the greatness of God. Sometimes they panicked and said, get out of this territory. We can't cope with this kind of thing. And um, also the man, the Gadarene demoniac, he wanted to follow Jesus and he wanted to be part of Jesus' ministry team. And he said, no, you go back and minister to your family. But the most terrible reaction of all was when they accused Jesus of being mad and ministering in the power of Satan himself. And those accusations were made frequently about Jesus. So we should not be surprised, therefore, when those who serve Christ in the deliverance ministry will be faced with something similar. So there we have a quick survey of Jesus' ministry of casting out demons. Now let's have a look at the disciples. I want to repeat what I've said several times in this course so far. Jesus never sent anybody out to preach the gospel without also giving them authority to heal sicknesses and to drive out demons. So we must expect it. Perhaps we, we uh, emphasize the healing ministry more than we do the deliverance ministry. We should there be prepared to minister in both. And he sent them out in the same way he sent them out to heal the sick because it was part of the proclamation of the gospel, and when the gospel came, sicknesses were pushed back. When the kingdom came, demons were pushed back, and demons were, were, people were released from demons. And so the disciples rejoiced that demons were subject to them. So they say, we, 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 we're so excited that even the demons are subject to us in your name. And the Greek verb they use there is hupotasso, which means to submit, to be subject. It's a military term, meaning to rank under or to surrender one, one's own rights and will to somebody else who's superior in rank. And so this is exciting. It's wonderful to know that demons submit to us in the name of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus shares this excitement. He doesn't pour cold water on it. He balances it and modifies it in a moment. But in Luke 10, verses 18 to 20, that's the passage that um, I, I'm talking about. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He shares that joy and he affirms it. He says, yes, the demons are subject to you in my name. And he said, as you were ministering, I saw something. You will see in the notes in the manual that I, I show you the Greek verb, the tense of the verb suggests that Jesus was saying, I have been seeing Satan falling. While you've been ministering, I've been watching. He, Jesus could see into the spiritual realm and he could see what was happening. And he says, as you were ministering, Satan was falling like lightning from heaven. In other words, Satan's kingdom was being plundered. Satan's kingdom was being destroyed. The strong man was being bound and his goods were being loosed. Hallelujah. Amen. I know you're in a Bible class, but let's have a mighty hallelujah that demons are subject to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's right. I can hear you clapping. Well, I can't. I can imagine you clapping out there as well watching this. Now, but at the same time, Jesus did go on to say, Rejoice, however, rather, 
that your names are written in heaven. Keep your feet on the ground, guys, with this ministry. That's what Jesus was saying. And it's so important to see that the deliverance ministry is only one part of the overall freedom that Christ has given to us for ourselves and to minister to other people. Now, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, it says in verse 17, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. So casting out demons is the first thing that's mentioned there. In my name they will cast out demons. <laughs> so uh, this suggests that this is an ongoing ministry. And in Matthew 28, Jesus commands his disciples to teach all future disciples to observe all Jesus' commandments, including this one, surely, that he gave them when he told them to go out and cast demons out and to heal the sick. And in the book of Acts, we see they did it. There are eight specific instances of healing there, one, uh, but only one of a demon being cast out. So there are eight examples of healing in the book of Acts specifically mentioned, but only one specific example of a demon being cast out. Although there are three general statements about um, demonic deliverance. We have one in Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. And when I say there's only one example, I don't mean to say that it only happened once, but there's only one example given. And other statements give us the idea that it was a frequent occurrence. And here's one of those statements, Acts 5, verses 12 to 16. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a great multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. And then also we have in Acts chapter 8 the story of uh, Philip going down there to preach the gospel in Samaria, and uh, it says in uh, verses 6, uh, Acts 8 verses 6 and 7, the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, he, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So it shows, of course, that it happened. Now the specific instance is of the Philippian slave girl in Acts chapter 16. Okay? And what happened was that as Paul was preaching there, this slave girl kept interrupting by saying, these are the servants of the Most High God. They, they're showing you the way of salvation, or the Greek actually says a way of salvation, not the way of salvation. So it wasn't necessarily a very healthy testimony. But she had a spirit of divination. And you'll see in the notes this is described in the Greek as a spirit of python, a python spirit which had something to do in Greek mythology with the Pythias dragon which dwelt at the mount, foot of, mount, of this mountain here, uh, Parnassus, guarding the oracle of Delphi. And it was, it was uh, uh, actually regarded as a soothsaying uh, demon uh, which would was be a fortune-telling demon. And sometimes it also acted as spirit, th th these people acted like spirit ventriloquists. It's a messy, horrible situation. But finally, uh, the apostle Paul commanded the demon to leave. And uh, the word there for command is parangelo, which means to order. And that word, parangelia, is a military term used of commands to do with uh, a, a senior officer given to a junior officer. And so the junior officer must obey the command given by the senior officer. It's the same word that Jesus used when he commanded the demon to, to come out. And so we find here that uh, Paul is ministering under authority because he's under the authority of Christ. He has authority over demons. You will not have authority over demons if you reject the authority of Christ in your life. You must first submit to the authority of God and then the demons will flee. That's what it says in the book of James. Submit to God and then resist the devil and then the demon will flee. 
Then we find also in Acts chapter 5, that passage that I read, where the, there was a uh, Peter's shadow healed the sick. And it's possible also that the shadow cast out demons. Now, when you read it, as you see from my notes, it's not exactly clear and technically, grammatically, it's probably that, that the uh, casting of the shadow over the people was, was applying to the sick people. But I see no problem with demons fleeing when a, when the, when a shadow comes. I see no problems with demons. I mean, demons try to scare you with shadows. Why don't you start scaring a few demons with your shadows? Uh, all right? Uh, and also through your very presence and under the anointing, the demons are driven back. So all this can happen. Also, we find in Acts chapter 19, where we have the Apostle Paul's clothing was used as, as to drive out demons. And you see, I teach that there is a sense, and the Bible acknowledges the representative power of clothing, representative power. There are examples of people touching the clothing of Jesus and being healed, and God can, can, can communicate His anointing in so many uh, strange and wonderful ways. And we must acknowledge, of course, that that can and does happen under the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. I've spoken about Acts chapter 19, about those vagabond Jews who, who, who tried but didn't manage to succeed, showing that there is no such thing as a technique involved here. But these seven sons of Sceva, they fled naked and mauled because they weren't submitting to the leading of God at all. They were just doing their own thing. And yet, here we have the most remarkable example of magnificent acts of deliverance in Acts chapter 19, because these people burned their occult books and their material. They repented and gave up their evil deeds, and of course they were set free. Although no particular deliverance ministry was recorded, I'm quite sure that they were set free and wonderfully, powerfully delivered and set free in the name of Jesus Christ through their repentance. Well, that brings almost to an end our survey of deliverance ministry in the New Testament. And when we come back, we'll finish off one or two points, and then we will talk about how we can be involved in deliverance ministry today. So God bless you. We'll see you at the next session.